Hello everybody and welcome. Look at this fantastic selection of cars behind me here. We've managed to assemble the very best of the performance cars out there today that of course happen to be electric. I'll give you a quick run through of each car and all the things I like and don't like. I'll be brutally honest about each one of these very best of the high performance cars out there today. Okay, so no particular order. Let's talk about these cars and give you my opinion. So we've got the Tesla Model 3 uh, Performance, now one of the most popular and accessible performance electric cars out there. So we'll talk about and compare that. The Tesla Model Y Long Range. We don't get the performance in the UK quite yet, but I have driven one. And the Long Range is pretty quick and you can buy acceleration boost, so it's no slouch at all. The Polestar, a little bit of a sleeper, I think the Polestar, distinctive modern looks. Certainly no slouch either, a high performance car, and it's got some really good qualities about that. Uh, the, the BMW i4 splits opinions on its looks. It's actually growing on me. Um, I've been driving this for the last four weeks now, five weeks, and it is also rather very good and very fast. Now, everyone probably knows I'm a bit of a fan of the Porsche Taycan. We've got a couple of versions available out there, so I'm gonna to talk to you extensively about the Taycan. Oh, isn't it pretty, the Audi e-tron GT. Gorgeous car. Underneath, same as the Taycan, shares a platform and everything. Very capable, very, very capable. Probably one of the rarest cars here. And then we've got what I think really kind of started it all, didn't it? Really, the high performance electric car that was desirable, the Tesla Model S. In this uh, country, we don't get the plaid, so viewers from the States, bear in mind, we don't have that. We're still waiting until probably next year. But we have had the P85Ds, P90Ds, P100Ds, and long range performances over here for a while. And I think they're still brilliant. And then, if you need the sheer space, Tesla Model X. Again, just unique, isn't it? A seven-seater that can do 0 to 60 in under three seconds. What a remarkable machine. So, let's get into it in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna start off with the Tesla Model S, because like I say, I think that's where really this thing began. The electric car that was still fast and so still desirable to people like me who like a little bit of speed and like their cars. Now, I'm gonna keep things as brief as I can in this video. We've got a lot to get through, so I'm just gonna try and summarize the key points I like and then anything I don't like so much about each car. We've done reviews in more depth about most of this stuff here. If we haven't done it yet, it's coming. So uh, stick with me and let's start off with the Model S. So one of the key things I like about the Model S, well, again, driving one recently, they're still right up there. I think they're still good. I think they still look good. I think they're still sharp. I think they're a nice size. I mean, it's a larger car, but it's not actually massive. Most cars are getting bigger and bigger these days. It's not too bulky. It's very streamlined, so it still has the best efficiency I get out of any of these cars. Uh, Model 3 probably being about the, as close as it gets. So they're still very efficient, and in the real world, they still have the best range. If you're driving one of the latest, the long range performance, or just even a long range, that's still a quick car, they really do generally do 300, 350 miles quite comfortably. In the long range, I've even set a record by driving from Edinburgh to London non-stop, 420 miles. So out of all these cars, it's still the one with the biggest range. I like the fact it's a hatchback and has a nice big practical boot with loads of storage in there. This big screen set the benchmark when it came out. It's still nice to use today. It's still easy to use, separate display there as well. The sound system's excellent. The navigation, the ease of supercharging, the route planning's all excellent. So it's still probably one of the easiest cars to do long distances in and in comfort. It's a very comfortable car, a great cruiser, much more so than the Model 3 or Model Y, which is a bit firm. The latest versions of these even have adaptive damping, so not just air height control, but also many uh, adjustments for the damper setting. So they're very, very good cruisers and I love them. The things I don't like so much, well, this center console has never been brilliant. Some of the fit and finishing, you know, isn't really up there with the, quite the modern standards today, but the new versions of the Model S, I've been in one and they are very, very nice. And the back seats are always a bit compromised as well. We've got a nice big flat floor area here, but just this distance here isn't enough. So you sit with your knees quite high and there's not a ton of headroom in the back here. So the back seat space has always been okay, but for lots of tall adults sitting in the car for a long amount of time, they're not ideal. But of course, if you want bigger space in the back seats and more comfort and more headroom, that's where the Model X comes into things. So if you've got a bigger family, it is just a fairly unbeatable package. You can open these doors wide, even in narrow spaces, and you've got a ton of room in the back. And you can even have, with seven seats, that you can actually get into, plus all the seats fold down and make yourself a little minivan. You can even camp in quite reasonably. Even the front space of the Model X is massive, and apparently you can even put golf bats in there. It's so big. This big panoramic windscreen is fantastic. Again, very comfortable place to spend a lot of time in. It's a great cruiser. 
it's laughable when one of these big things pulls away from the lights quicker than whatever else is next to you pretty much. Uh, the downside for the Model X really is 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 a, is a byproduct of its, of its benefits, which is that it's, it's a big car. So the downside of this is uh, it's quick in a straight line, but when you start getting to some corner and you suddenly start realizing its size and weight a little bit more, it is higher. And so it's a little bit harder to shuffle along a country road. And also for us in the UK, uh, just, just in London, it, it doesn't even fit through some of the width restrictions. So it is a big car, uh, but if you need the space, but you still want something that's ridiculously fast, it's quite unique. And of course, it's the only one here that's actually a seven seater. And I mean, an actual seven seater that I can fit into, front storage and also extra storage under there as well. <laughs> yeah, just doing some exercises. Kins, <laughs> you could recline in front, I'd be all right. And of course, the Tesla always gets software updates as well, so this is always up to date. It's the only car with dog mode, which is great if you're away and uh, you have a dog like me. The Tesla is still the only one really that does proper route navigation. Of course, the Tesla supercharger network throughout Europe is unbeatable. You can use other chargers as well, but it's still the Tesla that just does the best and most confidence inspiring route plan and it will take you to charges where there's plenty of them and they're easy to use and just plug in and you just use them doesn't matter where you are going in europe there's a load of them and it's very simple to use the other cars you just have to kind of get involved with planning your own route a little bit i wouldn't just put into one of those cars roam and head there like i would with a tesla and that says something doesn't it and that's one of the reasons why tesla has been the most popular and really is i think especially as the first EV, probably the best one to get into. Just be aware that if you own a Tesla Model X, you will be asked to do your friend's weddings and every single person you know or have seen your car's prom do as well. Mercedes EQS has got power doors, but the Tesla Model X has had these for years. Then we have the Audi e-tron GT. What do I think about this? What do I like most? Well, it's looks probably, number one. It's just gorgeous, isn't it? I do love it. Just have a look at it. But what else? Okay, so underneath the uh, GT, it's the same platform as the Taycan, so it actually drives really well as well. Good, sharp handling. I mean, I've never been too excited by fast Audis in the past. Always like the look of them, always nice to be inside, but this one also delivers. It's pretty quick, dual motor, 93 kilowatt hour battery is standard on these, whereas you can get smaller batteries and rear-wheel drive in the Taycan. These are all dual motor and with the bigger battery. So they're all over 500 horsepower, they're all quick. One of the remarkable things, it is a proper GT car. Don't underestimate its size, it's a pretty, pretty big car. But even one like this, this one doesn't have the air suspension. I've had an air suspension one before. This one's on cars, but it's still super smooth. In fact, I can barely tell the two apart. I was really impressed. In fact, I would go so far to say that this one on coils has got some elements I like over the air suspension cars. For example, you get like little ripples in the bend as you go around the corner and you're cornering a bit hard. It cannot upset the air ones. They can kind of skip the car sideways, but this is much more planted. You kind of get a bit more feel for what's going on. So it's great, great ride comfort and a fantastic cruiser. Interior looks pretty gorgeous as well. It's nice. I would kind of like to see this screen being a little bit bigger. It's got Apple CarPlay integration, but actually, it, it, though it's very good quality, the details there is actually kind of quite small and quite a long way away. The fonts and everything quite small. I'm not so keen on all this black shiny plastic around here because that just gets scratched. And although the RS models have got some beautiful Alcantara finishing and such like, this kind of more base GT one actually has just some fairly ordinary plastics in here, which aren't quite so premium as you might think for this price tag which we're talking nearly £90,000. So, um, but it is very, very nice. And I do like to see that it has paddles. That's good. However, the paddles, you want to kind of reduce the regen or sorry, increase the regen a lot. And they don't really do a great deal. But again, it's just a pretty thing and a nice place to be. For a low sleek car, the back seats are also really comfortable. So I've got a nice gap. There's actually cutouts in the battery so your feet can go lower down. What is that banging noise? In the back of this, behind my seating position, I'm very comfortable. Glass roof is standard in these as well. So I've got good light, it's nice and comfortable. You can't really get somebody in the middle. There is an extra seat belt in here, but you've got a, quite a big tunnel thing here, which isn't so ideal. But for four adults, no problem. The boot is also big, practical, and the seats fold in three sections. Proper mounting points for roof bars in case you want to have bike carriers and such like. And there's also some pretty practical storage at the front to carry cables or small suitcases. Efficiency isn't brilliant in one of these. I tend to get about three miles per kilowatt hour. 
Um, but on a run, they actually sort of start settling down. They're not that efficient for the short journeys and commutes, but on a run, they settle down. You can get between 250 and 300 miles out of one of these without too much trouble. But the charging speed, wow, you know, over 260 kilowatt charging speed we've pulled from one of these. And when we did a test, we went from 5% to 55% in just 11 minutes on a 350 kilowatt charger. So their charging speed is ridiculously fast, quicker than a Tesla even. Okay, the Porsche Taycan. So, yeah, I've never really been historically a Porsche fan, but when I first drove the Taycan, I was blown away. And anyone who's seen our Dirty Martini 4S that I've had for a year now, it is one of the only cars ever out of the thousands I've owned that I've had for one year. Uh, so there'll be a bit more on that one soon. Every time I drive it, I am just blown away. It is a very, very good car. So one of the things I like most about the Taycan is it is two cars in one. One is it's a fantastic GT, much like the Audi e-tron GT, it's a fantastic cruiser. It can sustain long journeys. It's extremely, extremely comfortable. Again, car suspension or the air suspension I've got in Forest is ridiculously smooth. So I can happily spend all day driving it up and down motorways. It rides almost as good as a Mercedes S-Class, I'm not even joking. But then, going to a sport mode, you can just put it around a track. I mean, you've seen our 4S go around Thruxton at over 140 miles an hour. It's a comfortable, everyday, long-distance cruiser that is also track-ready. And I think that's one of the things about the Taycan. It can do both very, very well. That Porsche heritage comes through, the suspension's excellent. So, yeah, I do have a bit of a soft spot, but let's run through some of the other little bits I like about the Taycan in particular. As soon as you get behind the driver's seat, it's just a nice place to be. Uh, it's very ergonomically designed. I like this, all the adjustments in the seat and steering wheel. It feels premium, it feels quality. It is just a lovely thing. But there's a few things I don't quite like as well. The native screen and navigation is all quite slow and laggy. It's never brilliant. It is saved by the fact that you've got wireless Apple CarPlay. I also don't like the fact you can't just move these vents around. You have to come onto the screen and do this kind of thing whilst you're driving. So that's not ideal. But other than that, it's not too much. I, I don't pick apart. Okay, there's one more thing that does bug me in mind. There's two cup holders here. This arm resting thing in here just isn't very convenient. And what I would like to see, there's a big storage space under here. Um, oh, well, this is different to mine. There's actually a tray that you can use there. Mine hasn't got that, things just fall off. So that's a bit better, but then it is awkward to get to. But as soon as you do this, and as soon as you drive it, you know, it is so good. It is very, very good indeed. It just has a feel about it, which I find addictive. And I just love how you can just switch between those two different modes, kind of quite an aggressive sports car, or just a relaxed cruiser for spending many hours in. The back seats are excellent. My daughter does comment that it's one of the most comfortable cars to be in the back of. Spoil little princess, I know. So it's just got that space, the light, the headroom. Again, if you've got the glass roof, it's just a nice comfortable space for four adults. Again, you can get the fifth middle seat is an option. Don't all have that in all the cars. Uh, it is a fairly futile option if you have it, but for the occasional child in the middle, it does work for us actually. So it is usable. Again, the boot space is big, spacious. We've done family trips with our suitcases, no problems at all. And the seats fold down, very practical. I do actually like this Porsche sound box as well. There's quite a lot of different versions of the Taycan. Smaller battery, bigger battery, rear wheel drive, four wheel drive, turbo, I've always hated the fact they use the word turbo, turbo S. Now the turbo S is ridiculously fast. You're doing runway stuff. It is probably one of the only cars that outpaces the Tesla Model S performance until the Plaid comes along, of course, we've seen that. So the turbo S is savage. But this one here is actually, I think, one of my favorite specs. It's just a rear wheel drive. It's got the bigger battery, but it's rear wheel drive only. Car suspension, a few of the key good options on it. Some efficient wheels, so you can get some good range of mileage out of it. Again, up to pretty close to 300 miles, real world. And again, it has super fast charging. So actually a more basic rear wheel drive is not as quick, but it is beautifully balanced. And I have to say, I've got a bit of a soft spot for this rear wheel drive version here. The other thing I would say about this is a Taycan does start getting very expensive. I mean, they're not cheap to start with, but the options list is horrendously massive. You do have to start ticking off bits and options and very quickly you can go well over hundred thousand pounds, even on a more basic spec. I mean, my 
dirty martinis, a 4S, but with air suspension, four-wheel steering, a few other things. I still don't even have keyless entry, and it's still over £120,000 new. Luckily, I don't buy it new, but they start getting very expensive. So that is the downside, but they are very special cars. Useful bit of storage space in the front here, nice and deep. And can I also make a comment that I genuinely find really brilliant about my Taycan and this Taycan and the Audi GTs. They've got a fantastic steering angle. The turning circle is ridiculously small, and especially on my Taycan, which has the rear wheel steering as well. It makes what is a big car extremely easy to move around multi-stories and car parts and such like. So really good turning circle. It's just a standout, useful daily feature that's easily forgotten. So then here we have the uh, topic of much debate, the looks of the i4 M50. Some like it, some don't like it. I didn't like it, but I've actually grown to like it, actually. I don't, you know, I've, I don't know. I just actually think I quite like its aggression. I sort of not obviously liking this, but then I don't think I liked beer when I first tasted beer. I don't think I liked olives when I first ate olives. I like anchovies now as well. Is that just age? Anyway, the i4, uh, I've grown to like this more than I originally did. I was originally kind of a bit disappointed, but it is growing me. So uh, this is an M50. This has got all the options on it as well. So although the i4 starts at a bit over £50,000, go to the dual motor M50 and then add some options on top of that. You can get up to about a £75,000 car, as you see here. So it's not cheap, but it does come well specified. I mean, very good laser headlights, a pretty good autopilot system, head up display, premium individual leather interior, carbon bits, the big wheels, performance brakes over uh, 80 kilowatt hours of usable battery. So it's got the spec and it certainly has the quality. Okay, so in the i4, you might like or you might hate this color scheme, but what you can get is quite a good choice of interior combination colors and finishes, sports seats or comfort seats. I mean, they're both comfortable, but I actually like the extra headrest adjustment that like these give and some more adjustment to the seat. Uh, so this has got individual with cross stitching and it just feels super nice materials. I mean, you've got to like leather, but it feels really good. I've got the carbon trim here, but again, there's different options there. It does feel very premium in here. It, as soon as you feel the steering wheel, I mean, there's a lot more buttons. It's nowhere near as simple as a Tesla, but you get used to it and it does have a great quality feel, even the door closure is solid, it's lovely. It's a fantastic cruiser, super comfortable. We've got a real mixture. We've got core suspension in the front, air suspension in the back, but it balances itself out quite well. So this M50's got a pretty good feel about it, but it's still comfortable at the same time. And like I say, I can spend many hours in this car, no problem at all. The Apple CarPlay also integrates really well, which I like. So your mapping is not just on there when you're using CarPlay, but it's also on here and it's also in the head up display. So, all very good, you say. Well, it's pretty good, but there's a few downsides as well. One is the native navigation and uh, sort of interfacing here is okay, but it's, you can customize widgets, but look at this mapping. I mean, the graphics in this mapping looks like something from many years ago. Like I say, Apple CarPlay saves the day there though. I do like having an iDrive control to move around on here rather than always having to prod the screen. So I actually like having that. Um, a start stop button and lever, I don't really get that. I don't like the fact there's one wireless phone charger which is back there, I always comment on this, and then you've got anything in the cup holders means you can't get it to or from your phone. Seat position is nice, loads of seat adjustment. I love the seats in this, it's brilliant. Side bolsters adjust, there's lots of adjustment, proper adjustable thigh support as well. But what I have found, and this probably only affects right-hand drive cars, probably uh, like us in this country, because we drive on the right side of the road, don't we? As in the correct side, not the, anyway, long debate. But I can't quite straighten my left leg out. This legacy of a uh, compromise, because this would sometimes have a gearbox inside here because it's a shared platform. One of the compromises is that I can't quite straighten my left leg out. I want to be able to move my left leg just a little bit more to the left when I'm not using it because it's always a bit to the right. After an hour driving, don't really notice it, but when you spend four, five, six, eight hours a day in the car, I just want a bit more pedal space so I can move my left leg over a little bit. And it's one of the things that the more I drive this car and the more long days I spend it, it's the one of the things that actually bugs me the most about this and it's kind of disappointing me. Other drivers, other seating positions, you probably won't have the issue. I don't know, is it just me? Is there anyone else out there? I'm a bit pedantic with some stuff, but that's my main gripe. The Harman Kardon sound system I've got in this one is a bit of a letdown as well. 
it's okay, but the Tesla Model S and X sound systems, the Model 3 and the Model Y sound systems are all better than this. So it's got Harman Kardon, but it's okay, Mini in my opinion. Which one? Mini. The Mini, the Harman Kardon and the Mini was even better than this. So it, uh, what I do see with the BMW i4 M50 owners, uh, you know, more and more being delivered now, most people that get their cars absolutely love them. They do really love their cars and I can totally see why. Again, any negatives, don't take it the wrong way. I'm purely being, you know, my pedantic side. And most people are very pleased. One of the key things is wheel size seems to make a big difference to real world range and efficiency. So with this, with the big wheels, 20 inch wheels, least efficient version, you're talking 200 miles in winter up to about 250 miles in summer. 18, 19 inch wheel options do seem to give people ranges going all the way up to about 300 miles of real world range. So they're very capable and efficient cars actually. Let's have a quick check in the back. So in the back here is where, again, it is just a bit small. If you use this for family use, okay, if you've got a couple of, uh, you know, younger kids or even young teenagers, but if you want to put baby seats in, they're a bit of a tight fit. We've got Isofix, but it's still a tight fit in here and I don't have a ton of space. So they are a little bit small in the back, but then the car isn't massive. It is a moderate size rather than being as large as a Model S. And it's certainly smaller than Taycans and Audi GTs, for example. It's not a massive boot, but it does have the practicality of being a hatchback. And it also has this brilliant little feature of a electric deployable tow bar. It's not standard, you've got to pay extra for this, but if you're going to tow occasionally or put bikes or bike rack on the car, I think this is excellent. The seats fold down in three different ways. So it's not vast, but it is a nice practical little package. These laser headlights are ridiculously good. So probably the best headlights of any of the cars here. Uh, and I won't even bother lifting this to show you the front storage because there is none. There is a big bonnet here with nothing underneath it where you can store not even one iPhone charge cable. And then we've got the Polestar. I like the Polestar, don't you? It's just different, isn't it? It's got a really nice design language to it. It's, everything's been thought out and really well designed. So you might not quite like the Polestar, but I think it really stands out. I think it's super modern. You don't see that many on the road. And when you do, I think they're quite distinctive. So I like them. I like the fact it's not too big. It's again, for the UK roads especially, it's not too long, it's not too wide. It's a nice medium sized car with some really nice little design language. And this one's got the performance pack. It's a 78 kilowatt hour battery performance pack. So it's four wheel drive, dual motor, big wheels, big brakes. And you've got some very clever Olin's dampers in here, which they're adjustable, but you do have to adjust them manually, but it's got some pretty trick suspension. In the front here, a mixed bag really for me. So I get, I like the design, I like the details, I like the touches, things have been thought out. Different materials, textures, the software is nice to use. They're nice to drive, they're quite quick, can be a little bit firm on the suspension, especially with the sport version, but dial off those dampers. But that brings me on to a couple of annoying things. Why are the dampers not a nice little button here you can make soft or hard? You know, you've got to actually kind of climb under the car and adjust them manually. So my recommendation is probably to have them in soft. And if you go and do a track day or you specifically like a harder core car, then you set yours to a firmer one, but you're never really going to keep adjusting them. The second thing is that although I sit in the car now and it's a nice driving position, it's all quite kind of enclosed here. It's not claustrophobic, but compared to a Tesla, it's much more built up. And I like all this software to use. That's excellent. That's second best to only Tesla, I think. There's one thing that bugs me in a long drive, and that is this bit here. My left knee bangs against this. Again, half an hour in the car, you'd never notice it. But after spending a day in one of these, it does kind of just get grinding. Me, my knobbly knees, I know. I know other people just don't have the issue. But for me, I just don't get why this isn't kind of a better design here and the sculpted out a little bit more or something. They thought about all the other little bits so well that when you get things like that, it just annoys me. <laughs> so I'm gonna rant about it a little bit. But anyone who, you know, chooses the Polestar, I totally get it. It's a very nice place to be. It just feels like, it probably feels the most modern if that makes sense and just designed and I like that. So yeah, well done Polestar, it's good. The initial cars I drove weren't brilliant on range. I mean, I struggled to get 200 miles out of them and then the charging speed wasn't brilliant either. So I think if you're doing lots of long journeys, they're possibly not the best, but we have seen incremental software improvements which have increased things like the charging speed and efficiency. So actually, they're again back up there. You can get 250 miles out of one with some pretty sensible charging speed as well now. So they're a nice balanced car and I don't blame anyone for choosing one.
Space in the back's not massive, but it's okay. You've got a central transmission tunnel thing here, so you can't really get anybody in the middle. But for a couple of adults, it's okay. It intrudes a little bit here, but not too bad. There's a little bit of storage at the front for a couple of cables. There's some excellent headlights. Perfect. Practical hatchback, pretty good boot, folding seats, bit of extra storage underneath, dividing compartment there, and you can even have foot gesture control. And it works. And we both agree here, and my colleague Gintz behind the camera, that this has got Harman Kardon system, much like the BMW, but this one does sound better than the i4 Harman Kardon. So the Model 3, the Teslas, the latest ones, the only ones we can get in the UK now, as far as the Tesla lineup's concerned. Uh, this is actually our long range, but I've had many Model 3 performance, spent many thousands, I've probably covered 40,000 miles in Model 3 performances, so I know them well. They are really quite unique. When you first drive one of these, they're so sharp. They're like little go-karts. The steering's super sharp. The dash is low, great visibility. And the Model 3 performance is seriously quick. I mean, we've had customers who've got Ferraris, and they have a go in the Model 3 performance. They're blown away because it's just so lightning fast. Its reaction's actually probably the quickest out of any of these for darting off a roundabout or getting down a country lane because it's smaller than the others. It might not be as quick off the line as the Model S performance, but it can feel just as quick when you're rolling because it's so much more agile and sharp. It's a very capable machine. You, you, they're track ready. You can go onto a track straight away with a Model 3 performance. But then if you want to take your track days really seriously, you can even get a whole ton of modifications now. Better suspension and brakes, loads of upgrades for them. So you can even do some pretty hardcore track days in them. And if you want to see a Model 3 performance standard versus a Porsche Taycan on track, we do have a video available there for you to see. So the Model 3 performance, it is good package it's a nice compact size for uk roads the passenger space is good the software is excellent the charging and efficiency is all excellent they're just super sharp to drive what are the downsides well usual stuff i have a little moan about really the headlights are led but they're not active matrix so they're a bit basic compared to a lot of the competition now the suspension is firm it has the body control which is great when you are driving hard, but when you're actually just in the car all day or just going around town, the suspension's a little bit crashy and firm compared to other cars as well. And then the usual Tesla stuff inside here, really excellent software, excellent routine navigation, efficiency, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I've said that loads, so I love all that. I love this minimal look in a, in a Model 3. It's fantastic, low dashboard. It doesn't have kind of like a, a premium feel, maybe like the Taycan, um, but I don't think it's bad quality. I never get people that criticize the quality, and the quality is all there. It's just minimal, so it looks different. I love all this big storage space you've got in here and the cup holders and phone chargers. That's all excellent. I've said that many, many times. In the back isn't too bad as well. A bit like the Model S, nice flat floor, but the seat to the floor does mean my knees are up a little bit. But I've actually got more space here than the Polestar, uh, or even here for tall person compared to the uh, uh, Porsche Taycan even. So it's pretty good for headroom, uh, but it's just kind of the knees up position really. But if you're gonna carry taller people in the back, that's where the Model Y comes into play. Because then you have tons of space. The Model Y, I can put my feet right out under there, all flat floor, great seat height, great headroom slightly reclining seats. The Model Y is the car if you want to carry more people and yet have something that's quite quick and quite fun to drive. The boot on the Y is massive, tons of storage in here, buttons to fold the seat, so super practical. And again, a very useful front storage space as well. Just a nice plastic tub, muddy wellies, sandy shoes, everything in there. So compared to the Model 3, it is obviously taller. It's the most kind of family SUV car here. But I think it's important to include it because it is a practical family car that is still really fast. So yes, we don't get the performance one quite yet. It is coming, uh, but a long range with the acceleration boost is no slouch. We did a video with CarWow and once we put acceleration boost in it, it beats a Porsche Macan GTS. So it is a performance car and I think it's worthy in this lineup. It's extra height here. It means the handling isn't quite as sharp as the Model 3. It doesn't pick up quite as fast as the Model 3. But if you put the acceleration boost on, it is quicker than the Model 3 long range without acceleration boost. So like I say, it is a quick car. 
Same little grumbles really, you know, fairly basic headlights compared to competition and some fairly stiff comp uh, suspension for day-to-day -day driving. And, and I don't find actually the seats as comfortable in this compared to say the Tesla Model S or X. But again, that's me, a lot of people prefer these seats. So uh, it's a good all-in package and the most practical out of all of them here, that's for sure. So uh, cars everywhere now as we've been pulling them all out to show you. Um, there's a real good mixture, isn't there? These are seriously all good cars that are, you know, practical to own, work with the family, but they're proper performance cars as well. They still put a smile on your face quicker than most combustion stuff you can get. And you certainly in the real world feel quick as well because of all with that lightning sharp acceleration. And they're all very cheap to run, you know, charge them up, fuel them up at home, easy to capable long distances. So it's a great, there's a choice out there now. I look forward to reading all your comments below which cars you like and what you like most about these cars, and especially if you own in one of these cars. No need to slag off other ones, say what you like about the ones you like, you know, and respectfully say what you don't like about others because it's always what I call horses for courses, I often say. Different cars will just suit different people and anyone who chooses any one of these cars should be very happy because they're all excellent in their own different ways. Uh, so yes, as I point out negatives, they're just my opinions, but I've got to keep it real. I've got to say the things that personally don't work so well for me compared to something else. Um, so they're all good and they will all be great for certain people and however you prefer them, what you want to use and what brands you prefer. I think the one thing I will take from all this is I've been trying all these different cars today and refreshing myself what each one's like. There's always one car that I often bounce back to that I've just got to have the respect for. And that is the Model S. The original Model S, uh, or the, really the last of the Model S's that we've had over here, the Model S Long Range Performance, it's still a standout car. I think its design still looks good. It's a nice balanced size. It has the straight line speed that still beats anything else. I mean, God, wait till the Plaid comes over here. We, plaid guys in the States, we know what they're like. Obviously they're phenomenal, but even I'm talking about the last of the, the Raven uh, older star Model S's. And they're the only car that still does over 300 miles easily. So 350 miles of range, the great supercharger network, the great software that keeps updating, the nice balance between being quite a sharp, comfortable car, sharp, comfortable, you know, good handling car, but comfortable as well is what I'm trying to say. And so it's still right up there, isn't it? And yet it's the oldest car here. So uh, the Model S, I think, gains my ultimate respect if you're going to say which one's your favourite. But... They're all brilliant. Hopefully you can see my enthusiasm for all of these because they are all excellent cars. So I think I better stop talking for now. I hope that's been interesting and useful. Uh, there are reviews on each one of these cars independently and there'll be more to follow. For example, with cars like the i4, we'll do a full review on that one soon. So stay tuned, stay subscribed and hit the bell icon for notifications. We'll see you on the next one. Time for me to finish and have a coffee. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for watching our videos. If you like our content and want to see more, don't forget to not only subscribe, but also hit the bell icon for notifications so you don't miss any new videos as they're uploaded. Plus, we're also on Instagram. Just look up R Simons or RSEV. Us, we're on Facebook and Twitter. So lots of news, stories and things as we go on each one of those channels.